And now, please welcome co-founder, Conservation X Labs, Alex Deegan, Chief Scientist, X Prize, Paul Bungie, Open Innovation Director for Conservation X Labs, Barbara Martinez. Seriously, what a great conference so far, right? Can we, can we give it up for Nancy and Olin? And, and I want to welcome you guys to the final pitch session for Make to the Planet. We had 16 unbelievable multidisciplinary teams from across the United States in a makeathon, which we called Make for the Planet, that we hope will be the first of many that we'll try to do to create models and prototypes of new solutions for addressing conservation challenges, a different kind of optimism, an optimism for the future based on the democratization of science and technology. They had 48 hours to respond to a group of five pitches. We had literally standing room only session. Pat Wright couldn't get into it, she told me. <laughs> 48 hours to come up with, with working prototypes, demos, ideas for incredible ideas, how to respond to these wicked problems the conservation conservationists themselves were fluxing by. Peter Leimgruber was all over himself, over two of them that we're actually going to see. Uh, a lot of them aren't conservationists. They're scientists, they're engineers, they're designers, they're planners, they're tech professionals, but they were willing to try and they wanted to try to solve some of these problems, which get us at this point of how do we actually broaden the solution sets that are out there. We also took a risk. We didn't know what we would get. Uh, we didn't know if this thing would work. Uh, but we thought it was worth it because we believe in open innovation. So I'm going to ask you guys, judge for yourself. But everything in conservation is a risk. And sometimes the biggest risk isn't changing what you're doing. It's doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. We need changes. We need innovation in conservation. Yeah, and in fact, I, I mentioned in the last panel that uh, all of this open crowd opportunities, that's precisely why I, I co-founded Conservation X Labs with Alex. How do we take the power of the crowd and innovation and technology and point it directly at stopping human-induced extinction for good? This weekend, this, in, this entire conference has been phenomenal with the stories of past successes, the things that, that have been putting us on that path. And now we get a chance to see what happened in literally in real time, that we can still solve these things. Uh, you can judge for yourself how this is, but we've also got a distinguished panel of judges to do it for us so that we can determine the winners. There are going to be four teams uh, out of the 16 that came, came here this weekend who, uh, who have been chosen as the finalists. They're each going to give two-minute pitches. Our distinguished judges that will be on stage here are going to determine the two teams that receive $2,500 in cash for their innovation. So let's meet the judges. First off, need no introduction, Nancy Knowlton. <laughs> Woo! Stand chair from Marine Science at Smithsonian Museum of Natural History, co-organizer, general rock star, amazing, amazing person. <laughs> Also, Brad Ack, Senior Vice President at World Wildlife Fund for uh, Oceans, and really like the best person if you want to geek out on oceans with, get a beer at Puget Sound and watch us, Brad. Stephen Van Rokel, who's the former Chief Innovation Officer for the United States of America. Uh, he's also now a, a philanthropist, a, an investor, and himself a maker, because you know, why not? I know you've already met His Excellency Olafur Grinson, the former former president of Iceland, the chairman of Arctic Circle, and as you just saw, just incredibly awesome in every single way, champion. I also just want to give a shout out to Barbara Martinez, who put this whole thing together. If you just please, please, I know she's trying to run away, but give her, give her a thanks. Okay, you guys ready for the first team? Absolutely. No, no, no. Are you ready for the first team? All right, that's it. Biodiversity, that's the team name. <laughs> Woo! Good afternoon. My name is Francesca Fernandez, and these are my colleagues at Accenture, Shannon Barrow, Fode Yola, and Mike Munn, and we are team Biodiversity. We've spent this weekend thinking about the problem of overfishing and how to tackle its root cause, which is, of course, human consumption. We've been particularly interested in what happens at restaurants. And so we want to build on the many great seafood buying guides that are already out there, pair it with publicly available data in the form of restaurant menus, and provide a more 
easy, user-friendly way of understanding the sustainability of those menus. This weekend, we scraped data from real DC restaurants, paired this with recommendations from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch Guide, and produced a sustainability ranking of over 40 seafood restaurants and their over 7,000 menu items. We've also envisioned an interactive app experience that um, would show you what this could look like given more time. So this is Menu Troll. It, um, it shows you restaurants nearby that serve seafood and how sustainable they are. It ranks them as a list, and you can go into each restaurant profile and have a look at the menu. Where there's ambiguity in the menu data, we also give you the opportunity to contribute to the data set by asking questions from your server about what is actually, where that fish is actually from, and thereby crowdsource more data. Ultimately, you can then determine how sustainable the fish on your plate is. We actually recognize that there's also fraud in um, menus and in, in seafood reporting, and so we envision full end-to-end -end traceability through integration of technologies such as blockchain, DNA sequencing, and crowdsourcing. We see a way to use machine learning to improve our algorithms, and ultimately, we seek to empower consumers to put pressure on restaurants and the entire seafood supply chain to provide more transparency and act more responsibly. And if all this talk of seafood has made you hungry, our algorithm tells us that Sushi Taro here in DC would be a great place to get dinner tonight. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Thank you. Team Biodiversity, now the judges have two minutes to, to, to interrogate you Shark Tank style. Well, maybe I'll start having uh, been involved in the sustainable seafood movement for about 15 years, and I would love to see a solution like this work. You mentioned the fraud. Fraud's rampant in the seafood industry, especially at the restaurant level. Just uh, imagine the last time you saw dredged scallops on the menu. They're always diver caught, but there's only about 5% of the market that is. So tell me more about how you would actually deal with that phenomenon of fraud in restaurants. Sure. So we actually are looking very much to technologies that are coming online within these next couple of years even. For one, DNA sequencing, which is something that Conservation X Labs is working on. And also there's an organization called Provenance, which has done, which has used blockchain technology, which underlies Bitcoin, and so is therefore an end-to-end -end immutable ledger of where fish has come from. They've done this for yellowtail and skipjack tuna, and so we would be looking to integrate that into our app. I have a question. Um, I really like the idea of ranking, being able to choose uh, restaurants because so often we don't have that information as a consumer. Can you imagine expanding this to all restaurants in terms of the energy used to create the and the menus and the sustainability of the different products, does it have to be just fish? It doesn't have to be just fish. Given 48 hours, that's what we went with. <laughs> Fair <And> also, enough. <laughs> um, uh, also, the, the region specific, uh, specificity is because uh, it's a time constraint, but we look to apply this to any geography. We could look to apply this to non-seafood items. We could also look to apply metrics such as understanding whether there's embedded carbon, how much water was used, how far it's flown, is there, human, uh, is there modern slavery in the supply chain? Uh, in less than 30 seconds, can you talk about um, integration with social platforms, Yelp, other things, and, and how you've thought about that? Sure. So we actually give, at every stage of the experience, the user an opportunity to engage socially and, and, and therefore sort of build the, the voice around this. Uh, from the very beginning, you have the opportunity to uh, state whether or not um, you are actually going to a restaurant based on this app. Once in the restaurant... Or, yeah, once in the restaurant, you can um, ask questions of it online, publicly, and then ultimately you can share it with your friends what you chose to eat, why, and where. Okay, cool. Thank you. Awesome. Give it up for biodiversity. Yeah, yes. That was with 30 minutes prep, just for you guys to know. So our next team, if you guys will give them a hearty welcome, is Green Eggs and Sam. <laughs> All right, hi everyone. Uh, we are Green Eggs and Sam, and uh, I'm Sam. Um, <laughs> one of the major problems currently facing uh, wildlife, traf uh, wildlife tracking is the fact that we are predominantly tracking uh, large species. So one of the challenges that was set for us this, uh, this weekend was how do we track small species? Uh, currently, the tags that we try to make for these small species are expensive for, or, or inefficient 
due to battery life and other, a whole lot of different uh, measures. Um, so we took a step back and we said, instead of designing a new tag for every single animal, what if we didn't even have to tag the animal? So, we came up with a solution uh, we like to call, uh, <laughs> we like to call um, detect. Essentially, what we are trying to do is use chemical tracing uh, or smells of an individual animals. The idea behind this is that each animal gives off a pheromone or a, or a unique odor. What if we could attach a sensor that could go around a, a, an existing uh, tag, a collar tag, um, that, we could, uh, that we could use as a proxy to, to track these smaller animals? So in the last 48 hours, we have managed to prove this concept. We have found a sensor that can do this. Essentially, we have created a system um, with a simulation or with actual data. This, and this system, this, sim this simulation shows that uh, based on interactions, we can uh, detect a, uh, we can detect enough interactions between the animals uh, to produce uh, these heat maps that you see up on our slide. Essentially from this, we can start to gain a, a deeper understanding of the ecosystems at large based on uh, current tag technology that is already in the, in the field. Thank you. All right. Judges. So would the vision here be that, that you, you put a sensor on a moving, a moving animal, maybe a larger animal, and as they walk around, they're actually sensing yes. um, the signals of smaller animals? Yeah, is, sorry, that, is that the concept? Yeah, sorry, sorry, I just should clarify. Um, essentially, what we're trying to do is put a, a tag, on, currently we put tags on predators uh, predominantly, um, and we're using that as a, as a proxy to track these smaller prey items that uh, we currently cannot put tags on easily. Um, uh, so not only are we with this, with, this ta with this additional sensor, are we tracking this individual animal, we are getting an idea of the interactions with the rest of the ecosystem um, that this animal is, is, is a part of. And do you have a sense of what the pheromone range is of small animals that? It's our understanding that the pheromones last for a couple of days, which is, which is nice. Um, but additionally, we, we, we have found uh, information around, around 200 meters. The, the data points that we have on our slides, if we could actually bring that up, um, show um, basically interactions in a certain time, in a very particular time frame when they were um, actually within the same uh, 200 meter radius. So these would be, uh, these are a result of only five, finding five prey um, animals. And how, how, um, how do you anticipate the data would be accessed and how would it be used for conservation? What would yeah. be the impact? Yeah, so, um, I mean, we are creating a completely new data set right now. Um, the idea is that uh, you would have a, a pheromone bank. Uh, essentially, you would be able to uh, trace different smell signals in, in the ecosystem. Um, we would uh, then allow that data, ideally, to be open access uh, to, to develop this, uh, this technology, because it doesn't really exist right now, uh, with further algorithms and statistical uh, analysis. Have you assumed that uh each example of one species has the same smell, or is there a proven science that, that tells you that? Yeah, so it, it, it's, it's, it's uh, well known that each uh, animal has a unique smell. So we can actually detect species based on uh, different smell signatures, or pheromone signatures, um, because it's an evolutionary tactic that, that these animals use. Yeah, because we have uh, often been told that uh, Individual humans have uh, different smells. I mean, you smell differently from mm -hmm. those dogs, for example. <laughs> that's true, that's true. Um, but we, so, are you saying the humans are the only species that each individual has a different smell? It is true that, that there are different pheromones given off for different stress states, for example, and stuff like that, but there are common chemicals that are, are common to specific species. Okay. With that, thank you, Team thank Green you. Eggs and Sam. Smell you later. <laughs> I'm a dad, I'm allowed dad jokes. <laughs> the next team, Paw 2017, please welcome them. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. How are you doing?
Six Men's is a local village on the island of Barbados, one of the islands of Barbados with 10,000 people. Uh, the local community relies heavily on their fishing industry, but right now over 60% of the coral reef systems have been destroyed by increasing algae populations, uh, which just sits on the ocean surface and tends to block out sunlight and cause uh, coral bleaching. So today we are proposing to you uh, Moralga, which is a surface skimming device, which will pick up this excess algae, and then from that produce biofuels and livestock feed. So our device works by using two boat floats under the surface here that will keep it both floating on the surface of the water and give it stability to prevent flipping and tipping. As it moves through the water, it's powered by these two thrusters, which are powered by a solar panel that's mounted on the surface. As it moves through the water, the algae will go in through the mouth and be captured by this membrane bag. Inside, it's going to have a chopper, which will cut up the algae and turn it into a slurry, which we can use for processing later. And when it's installed, it will be tied perpendicularly to a buoy, which will cause it to move in a circular motion while it's in the water. However, as it moves, it will actually, the tying cord will wrap around the buoy and cause it to spiral in, creating a circular area that will cover. Once the algal slurry has been produced, we could partner with various organizations such as Origin Oil, which is based in San Francisco, or process the algae ourselves. Using basic chemistry, we would be able to maximize the amount of biomass and biofuel generated while simultaneously producing zero waste. That biofuel would be produced in a similar fashion from the biofuel from corn and soybeans, um, and the algal biomass could be dried and subsequently converted into animal feedstock. So right now we're working with a two by one meter model that is both adaptable and scalable. And this adaptability is really great because it will allow us to, in the near future, do things like clean up, uh, clean up microplastics off the surface of the ocean and clean up after oil, um, after oil waste. Uh, eventually we hope to sell our product to aquaculture firm farms as well as team up with environmental agencies. Hopefully these agencies will be able to subsidize us, and if they do subsidize us, we will be able to get our uh, product out to places all over the world uh, that definitely need the help, including those islands out in Barbados. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right, let, let the shark tank begin. <laughs> I have, a, I have a question. Um, what do you do about the situation when there's more than one kind of thing floating on the surface of the water? So mixture of plastics and algae and who knows what else. So one of the interesting ways about the processing technique that they've developed um, is that the first phase requires an electronic pulse and that electronic pulse that is sent through this kind of slurry causes all of the algal biomass specifically to flow to the top of the surface of the water. That can then be scraped off almost using like a mechanical arm that leaves anything else that would be in the solution that's not algae to continue to float um, within this uh, uh, device. That then is transferred and essentially aerated using carbon dioxide, which causes anything solid that's not water to sink to the bottom. That can then be filtered out, so whether that includes plastic, whether that includes remaining algae, um, that can be immediately scraped out, and then you're left with essentially a pure saline solution that can be redeposited in, back into the ocean. Love, love the concept, critically needed. <laughs> what, what's the business model? This uh, so far hasn't penciled out um, algae-based uh, fuels and, and foods and oils. Still not competitive. What do you think? Right, so we'll be working with uh, commercially selling these to aquaculture firms. We have the long-term solution of including Arduinos to make this solution more autonomous so that it can rotate in more of a grid-like pattern so that we can use it offshore in more of a commercial sense. Uh, we've also expecting the cost to be as low as $104 to produce per unit. Um, and with this, we could easily subsidize, again, like earlier mentioned, um, we could subsidize these products to be used in areas that need them the most, whilst also selling them commercially. Mm -hmm. One more question, you good? Any idea on how you dry the algae? That's another big uh, cost, generally. That can be done on land or on the transit. So this essentially is a device that'll be used offshore in the water to collect the algae. But once you finish collecting the algae and fermenting it for about 30 days, that's how long it'll take to uh, churn up the solution. You can very easily put everything, all the waste, into a bucket on a boat and then leave it out to dry once you reach land. Uh, even if you want to perform the electrolysis, the chemistry that, um, that was previously mentioned, you could perform that wet on the boat as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you to Team Paw 2017, phenomenal. <laughs> See that built, built in a weekend? Hey, listen. Incredible. We're good. 
That was printed on a 3D printer literally in the middle of the conference as they were designing the prototype. Uh, we have one team, last but not least, Terra Medics. Please welcome them. Jay the Blue Jay doesn't own a computer, but he needs antivirus protection. His habitat is near a port of entry where potentially deadly new pathogens can sneak past custom inspections. The threat to wildlife is devastating, but it doesn't stop there. Zoonotic diseases are estimated to account for approximately 60% of emerging human pathogens. We need to know when new diseases arrive on our shores so we can stop them before they spread. Our solution, Smart Seeds, combines innovations from cybersecurity and biomedicine to provide an early warning system for emerging infectious diseases. By collecting data on urban wildlife health, we'll be in a better position to detect new outbreaks. Biomedicine offers promising new designs for ingestible sensors that we can adapt for wildlife. Our Smart Seeds will collect data on the location and health of small animals in urban environments using backyard bird feeders as data receivers. The sensor itself will be about the size of a pumpkin seed and will be powered by peristalsis, the gut muscle contractions that move food through the intestinal tract. Once our sensor is field ready, we'll do a, a GIS risk ass assessment to identify susceptible habitats near ports of entry. There, we'll start to collect baseline data on common urban species like cardinals and gray squirrels. Once we understand what's normal for these species, we'll be able to use them as sentinels for new disease outbreaks. We can process the sensor data through an open source platform called Siphon, developed for cybersecurity, but which we'll use for biosecurity. Imagine if we could detect and contain the next chytrid fungus before it can spread. With TerraMedic Smart Seeds, maybe we can. Excellent. Dis distinguished judges. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> what, what, what's the scalability of a, of a solution like that? So a bird ingests a seed and then flies 20 miles away. How do I, how do I get a read on that, uh, on that bird? So the way we have the um, sensor data recovery is it's not so much that we have uh, real-time telemetry. We've allowed for some latency, such that um, the passive RFID tag that is transmitting the data transmits when the bird comes back to the central node, um, which would be the bird feeder in this case. Okay. Well, how are you going to make this commercially viable? Who would be the financial advantages? So we, can, we think we can actually adapt this for pet monitoring. So you know when your pet is, might be falling ill and needs to go to a vet, and we can use the profits from that to fund the wildlife monitoring. How long does the seed stay uh, in residence, and then how do, you, <laughs> how do you recover it? I hate to ask that. So without going into too much detail, our, our, our sensor is a composite of rigid and biodegradable materials. And so using an intelligent design of degradable and non-degradable materials can control the size and the shape of the sensor within the organism. And as it degrades, you can control when it actually is excreted and have temporal resolution uh, specific to the animal that you're interested in. So longer than a seed, basically, is what you're saying. It'll, it'll actually embed, <laughs> embed and degrade over time slower than, than normal food, food mass or whatever. So if you know what's normal, say, in a pet, or, and, and, but then you get, say, thousands and thousands of things that are rare but abnormal, how are you going to decide which one of those weird things that isn't normal is actually a threat? Um, probably, well, our idea is to actually sample many different species, so bats, frogs, um, small mammals, uh, including bats. And we can probably assess mortality based on how many anomalies we're seeing in the data set. And at that point, that would be what would trigger an investigation to look into what's happening. Thank you, Team Terramedics. That's right. incredible. That's great. Thank you. All right, our, uh, our distinguished judges now are going to deliberate on what you've all seen. Um, while we all reflect on, is anybody else a little like, 
48 hours, a bunch of people, most of whom uh, are not conservationists, build these things. This is. We're going to turn off their mics. Oh yeah, so turn, we, we are going to turn off their mics. So, 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 the, so it's quiet. Um, and, and by the, how many of you have ever been to a conference like this where people are literally solving problems in real time? Nancy, Steve, thank you for this. This is incredible. This is. I, I hope you guys are are are. As, as inspired as, as we are. And I hope, go see the rest of them. They're in the Innovation Commons afterwards. All of these teams, 16 of them, you'll be, you'll be blown away by what they've done. But this is not where it's meant to end, is it, Alex? No. How is it that everybody else can get involved, dear friend? Well, I think, I think it's fundamentally, it doesn't have to end here. And I think this is one of the challenges we have. Paul and I both have led on, pro on prizes and grand challenges when I was at USAID. And it's not just about the finalists. It's about building a new community that together with conservation that we can actually take on these challenges and be able to solve, solve them. To carry the ideas forward from this challenge, we have built a digital makerspace, and we've done so in partnership with WWF. It's part of an initiative we call Ocean Sex Labs. It is a mass collaboration platform and a multidisciplinary community to help take these ideas from all these prizes and challenges, from all the ideas that you guys have had during the conference and help make them real. The hardest thing I had to do as a judge was all those ideas actually had merit. It was decimal dust that was the difference between them. And we want everyone to succeed. So we're actually inviting you guys all to be the hero in terms of conservation, to join a community of makers and solvers at this site uh, and join that community and, and launch this digital makerspace with us. And the makerspace itself is one of the products we're trying to, to, trying to, uh, to, to develop and build over time, so you can provide us feedback on it. Are the judges ready? We are ready. Uh -huh. In great suspense, uh, we are going to invite His Excellency, President Grimson, tell us the winners. The first winner. The first winner, yeah, first winner and then the second. Well, they, they are kind of co-winners, as I understand. Yes, they're, that's, that's they're right. They're co-winners. No particular winners. Right. Yes. <laughs> I have been on a number of juries through my life, but this is the first time I've been in a jury that meets in front of the audience. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad somebody turned the mic off. <laughs> but maybe next time you should have the mic on. So. <laughs> And we, but we hear, well, I can't decide, we can't yeah, decide, exactly, we're so ready. Exactly, oh, exactly, awesome. exactly. But it was, uh, actually it was a great unanimity uh, among the jury, and we did not talk before, uh, so to make that clear. Maybe. There was no kind of conspiracy process. <laughs> <laughs> I think actually, at least in my case, I hadn't really met them before. And uh, I want to make that very clear. <laughs> I'm also speaking in order to increase the suspense. <laughs> okay, so there are two co-winners. They are not ordered, the first or the second. That's right. They are co-winners. And I will take them and announce them in the alphabetical order. <laughs> it's really good. So the first co-winner is biodiversity. Biodiversity! <laughs> Okay, maybe we let you start note, here. Note the lovely 3D printed trophies that were being printed <laughs> right. during the conference as well. Thank you, Barbara. Next. Well, I don't know whether this had been announced or shown before, but this is... Uh, <laughs> Never been seen before. No, ever. this is... Uh, we have a statue of the Oscar, but this is a statue of a frog. Uh, <laughs> which uh, is skirt. very symbolic as a golden. leaping forward and, yes. and jumps. <laughs> Literally the golden frog. Yeah, exactly. So, Without further ado, I announce the other co-winner, which is Poor 2017. Yay! Woo! Congratulations. Congratulations. Well, let us also give a great uh, applause to the other two teams that uh, did very well as well. Yeah. 
Thanks to all of, uh, all of these winners. Thanks again to Barbara for putting this on Woo! all weekend. This is incredible. Yeah, right. It's <laughs> good. Yeah. <laughs> so we're squeezing in now. <laughs> you get to watch us all take pictures. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thanks, you all. Thanks to our judges. No, no, no. Thanks to all of the teams that competed in this. Please check them out. Uh, join the makers that did join, the makers. Join us. Be solvers, be heroes. Thank you. Yes.